fighting to make progress into the future on every issue that plagues our community. Please join me in welcoming the woman who first came to Congress in the late 90s and is now a shining star in the United States Senate. Please welcome Senator Tammy Baldwin. Thank you, Kim. Uh, Kim has been such an extraordinary leader in our community and with the Victory Fund. And Kim, you and Lynn have been such extraordinary friends to me over many years and many elections. We are all so grateful for the work you do to advance the cause of equality. And Aisha, I want to thank you for your leadership and the inspiration that you are providing at Victory Fund. And thank you especially for seeing opportunity where others see setbacks these days. I want to acknowledge the great work of the Victory Fund boards. The Victory Fund board, the Victory Campaign board, and the Victory Institute board. And I want to give a special shout out to the Victory Fund board chair, Chris Abley, who also serves as Wisconsin's elected county executive. Chris, thanks for all your support and what you do for Wisconsin. Now, it is wonderful to be in a room full of good friends and great activists. And thank goodness for the champagne, huh? <laughs> of course, when I spoke at this brunch four years ago, the champagne was there not so sh we could drown our sorrows, but rather so that we could toast our success. Four years ago, we were fresh off an election cycle in which we had re-elected a president who had, who had proven himself to be a great ally of our cause. And for the first time that November, voters had rejected amendments that would have written discrimination into their state's constitutions. Meanwhile, we were all eagerly waiting what would prove to be an epic and historic decision from the United States Supreme Court. And of course, thanks in large part to many of the people in this room, I had the chance to speak to you not only as a proud member of this community, but as a newly elected member of the United States Senate. And now, I remember feeling such gratitude, such pride, and such hope for the progress yet to come. And I want you to know today, as I face a difficult campaign for a re-election, and we all face the new reality created by last November's election, I want you to know that I am still incredibly grateful for your support, and I'm still proud of the work that we're doing together to advance the cause of equality, and I'm still hopeful that more victories lie ahead. Now, earlier this month, I introduced our Equality Act. It's, it's an historic, comprehensive, non-discrimination -discri bill that would finally establish once and for all that lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender Americans are citizens in full, entitled by law to the same rights and protections as everyone else. From the moment that you helped me bring my voice to the US Senate, I've been using it to argue that America is ready to take this kind of leap forward and ensure that we leave the next generation a country that is more equal, not less. And with each passing year, more and more of my colleagues have come to agree. You know, two years ago, we had 40 co-sponsors in the Senate on the Equality Act, and today we have 46. <laughs> 
Two years ago, we had 158 co-sponsors in the House, and this year, we have 194. Now, will we pass the Equality Act into law this year? I doubt it. And not because we couldn't win a vote on the floor. Indeed, I think we would, and I even think it would be a bipartisan vote. Our challenge is no longer convincing enough Democrats to stand up to their values or persuading enough Republicans to listen to their hearts. It's now about replacing those House and Senate leadership that refuses to allow us a vote on the floor. Now, increasing the number of co-sponsors may not sound like a victory, but I have to tell you, between now and next November, victory, success, isn't going to quite look the same as we've recently experienced it. it. It's not likely to be us cheering on the steps of the Supreme Court or standing behind the President at an Oval Office signing ceremony. Victory is going to come in some very different forms. In the conversations we have with our fellow citizens, in the actions we take together, and in the progress that we're able to protect through our work. We've been there before. For decades, our gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender community has worked tirelessly, building support person by person town by town, winning victories at the city council, changing corporate policies, recruiting another ally in a state legislature, and electing our own to office. We defined victory by the bills we introduced and the attacks on our community that we beat back. And in the short term, that's sadly what victory may look like again. For example, back in February of this year, we were all shaken by rumors that President Trump was considering rescinding President Obama's order that requires all federal contractors to maintain non-discrimination uh, policies related to sexual orientation and gender identity. There would have been nothing we could do had he decided to move forward. But the, despite the fact that we had no lever of power to stop him, President Trump didn't rescind that order. Now, at the time, you may recall, his kids got the credit. Ivanka and Jared, people said, they're the voice of reason at the White House, <laughs> and they saved the day. <laughs> Maybe. But I believe it was the work that we have done over the course of a generation, from the organizing we've done in our communities to the checks that we've written to support candidates who share our values that helped avert that catastrophe. Now, even earlier this month, we got word that to celebrate the National Day of Prayer, the President was planning to sign Another new order that would be a license to discriminate against LGBT people in hiring and in the provision of services, all in the name of religious freedom. But in the end, that order, albeit troubling for other reasons, did not take aim squarely at our community. So was it Ivanka and Jared to the rescue again? Maybe. But we should understand that it's our activism that created the environment in which even President Trump felt he needed to tread lightly and carefully. And that these victories, as unfulfilling as they are compared to the ones we've won in the past, these are worth celebrating. The strength we've shown in the past will protect us in these difficult times. But it's the work that we do right now that will lay the foundation for more progress in the years ahead. 
Now, you know, Republicans spent eight years pining for the day when they'd have access to every lever of power again. But they forgot to make a plan for what they'd do when that day arrived. <laughs> you know, for seven years, they tried to repeal the Affordable Care Act. They voted to do it literally more than five dozen times. But when the dog finally caught the car, <laughs> it turned out that they didn't have a clue, a plan, or anything for what would come next. Now, I can't predict what's going to happen on health care in the months ahead. But I can tell you this. They blew it. And they blew it not just by this, yeah. They, they blew it not just by the slapdash way they rushed this bill through the House, but by failing to be smart and strategic during the years leading up to it. I tell you this because we can't afford to make that mistake. We need to use this moment to recommit ourselves, not just to our values, but to our ideas. And we need to assert ourselves within our political parties, within all the resistance movements popping up, and within the progressive movement, and make sure that we are ready to move forward, like on the Equality Act, the minute we have the opportunity to do so. And we, meet, we need to make sure that we have that opportunity sooner rather than later. Next November, we have the chance to win the kind of victories that are worth celebrating with champagne. It's not just about replacing Republicans with Democrats. It's about proving that our reaction to a setback, like the one we just experienced last November, it's about proving that it's time to speak up and make our voices heard louder than ever before. And Literally, we're off to a good start. I can't tell you how much it means to me, how much it has literally lifted me to see so many people marching and taking action this year, to see so many new organizations form, to see so many new leaders emerge, and especially people who are standing up and making their voices heard for the very first time. It seems like every day that I speak with someone who says, you know, I've never been much for politics, but what I see this is administration is doing to my friends and my family and my community, I can't just sit idly by. But this engagement, it can't be like our New Year's resolution. You know how that goes, right? You decide you're going to get in shape, <laughs> You buy yourself a treadmill and a new pair of sneakers. That first week, you run, I don't know, four or five miles a day, and you feel great. And then it's June. <laughs> and you're only using that treadmill for hanging your dirty laundry. <laughs> and you have no idea where the sneakers are anymore. And it's not because you're lazy. It's because it's hard and you don't get to see the results overnight. Well, the same is true for us. We cannot afford to get discouraged. We cannot co afford to get complacent. We have a lot of miles to run. Now, I'm on the ballot next November. There are already, yeah, well, let's do that. <laughs> but. Believe it or not, there are already two multimillionaires planning to run against me, and a third guy who already has his own out-of-state super PAC. So come 2019, we could find ourselves back in the day when our community didn't have a voice in the United States Senate. Or I could be standing here as the first openly LGBT person to be re-elected to that body. So, but, 
But this is not just about me. It's about the candidates that we must recruit up and down the ballot by showing them that if they stand up, they won't stand alone. It's about the conversations that we can have in our communities and the movement that we can grow and strengthen. It's about the small victories that we can win every day and the big ones we can celebrate starting in November. We may not be in quite the celebratory mood that we used to be these days, but our movement has never been stronger and our work has never been more important. And I have never been prouder than to be a part of it. So now is the time to seize the moment. We need everyone in this effort. There is no time to sit on the sidelines. I am all in. Between, yeah. So, between now and next November, I'm gonna work my heart out to get this country back on track. I'm gonna be running a strong campaign for reelection and working in Wisconsin and across the nation to organize for victory. And I know you are with me. So here's our plan of action, all right? Take notes here. We're gonna support our LGBT elected officials. We are gonna recruit and continue to recruit strong LGBT candidates to run for office. We are gonna support them with our time and our money. We're gonna organize our communities to make the case and build the support for the values we share. And we are gonna turn out every single pro-equality voter that we can find. And because of that work, next November, we're gonna win elections and put this country back on track. And, and once and for all, make full equality the law of the land. Now let's get to work. Thank you.